Welcome to the A to Z of Dragon Age, which is doubling up sort of as a countdown to Veilguard because Veilguard comes out in 26 days. 26 days. Very exciting. Um, and we are going to have between now and then a daily video going through the alphabet. And in each one, I'm going to pick characters, places, creatures, objects, things from the Dragon Age universe for each letter and give you some nifty little facts about each one. And I'm going to try and pick some, I mean, I'll, I'll be covering like the big ones, but I'm going to try and pick some like more obscure ones as well. So you might actually like learn something because I thought it would be a bit boring if I just kind of tell you everything that you just know from playing the games. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like I might end up missing out some, uh, some of the bigger ones that you might expect me to cover in favour of like some littler ones. Anyway, we are starting off with the letter A, imaginatively, and with quite a big one. In fact, the letter A is uh, its quite a popular letter. This was quite a difficult one to uh, narrow down. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of A words in the Dragon Age universe that I could have gone with. But anyway, we start with Alistair. Yes, swooping is bad. Alistair is a Grey Warden and companion in Dragon Age Origins, and you have to recruit him. He's not unrecruitable. You have to have him with you. Um, he has the potential to appear in all three games, though it's not guaranteed. It sort of depends what choices you make and what ends up happening to him, because he's not necessarily going to survive Origins, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, he is the secret illegitimate son of King Marek and the Grey Warden Fiona. And that is Fiona who we meet in Inquisition. And by that point, she's not a Grey Warden anymore because she becomes not a Grey Warden through... Circumstances that are not entirely made clear, but she she's sort of she's cured of the taint. But you know what? We'll get to her later in the in the alphabet. Uh, yes, she is uh, Alistair's mother, which you may not necessarily know because that is covered in the book The Calling. And you will notice that Fiona is not only an elf but also a mage, which means Alistair is half elf and also has mage blood in him. Which is sort of interesting. It's sort of not something people talk about a lot, but it's kind of interesting, right? Um, worth noting that in the Dragon Age universe, um, when humans and elves breed, breed, mate? What am I trying to say? Procreate? There we go. <laughs> Procreate with each other. Um, the children are always human. Which is another interesting thing, which isn't talked about that often. Because, like, how can you be, how can you have elf blood in you and yet be fully genetically human? How is that possible? Like, are humans just a breed of elves? Are humans like a disease who are trying to wipe elves out? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Alistair knows nothing of his elven heritage, uh, believing instead that his mother was a maid in Redcliffe Castle who died giving birth to him. And such a maid did exist, I'm pretty sure, and apparently did die in childbirth. You can even track down her one surviving daughter. Goldana, who Alistair believes to be his half-sister, and honestly, it's probably a good thing that she's not, since she turns out to be a little bit of a tit. Although, I don't know, maybe you can sympathise with her a little bit, she's probably had quite a hard life. Anyway, Alistair was raised by Arl Eamon at Redcliffe Castle until Eamon's wife, Lady Assault, took a disliking to him, and he was sent away to the Chantry, uh, eventually being trained as a Templar. However, he never took his vows because he was recruited into the Grey Wardens by Duncan, who had served alongside Fiona, Alistair's mother, in the Grey Wardens in his youth, and uh, even knew Alistair, albeit briefly, when he was an itty bitty teeny tiny newborn baby. Uh, but uh, Alistair didn't know that, of course. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that Alistair and Duncan develop this sort of father-son relationship, kind of, in Origins, because uh, Duncan did know Alistair when he was a little newborn, um, and sort of helped to... Uh, you know, get him to Redcliffe and set him up in life and then came back to recruit him into the Wardens later. <laughs> Which, you know, for motives we can only guess at. Interestingly, and I do find this interesting, everybody went to extreme lengths to cover up the fact that Alistair's mother was an elf, right? But everybody's totally cool with him knowing that his father is the king. Like, Alistair is fully aware that he is the king's son. But they lied to him about who his mother was, which is, I don't know, it's odd. But anyway, with the death of uh, King Caelan at Ostagar, Alistair's half-brother, uh, Alistair is the only known surviving blood heir to the throne. Um, and depending on what choices you make, he can suffer one of many fates by the end of Origins. He can become king, 
and rule alone. You know, he is the blood heir, even though he's illegitimate and has never ruled anything before and is wholly unsuited to be king. Apparently, it's just absolutely fine to make him king. Um, <laughs> he can become king and marry Caelan's widow, Honora, which is hilarious. Um, he can also become king and marry uh, the warden who you are playing as, as long as she is of the human noble origin. So she has to be female and she has to be of the human noble origin. It's not necessarily a marriage of, like, love. It can be, if you're romantically entangled with him, but it can just be a, a, a marriage of political convenience. And if you are in a romance with either Zevran or Leliana, um, you can potentially keep either of them on as your lover. Uh, and <laughs> Something I particularly love is if you marry Alistair but keep Leliana on as your lover, when you get to Inquisition and you get to the Winter's, the, the, the Winter Palace, um, when Leliana is introduced in the ballroom, she's introduced as mistress to the Queen of Ferelden, which I just adore. I did an entire playthrough just to get that one cutscene because I'm that sort of person. Anyway, back to Alistair. He can remain a Grey Warden and let Honora become queen and he just um, completely, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not quite rejects gives up his claim to the throne. There's a better word than that, but it escapes me right at this moment. And Honora becomes queen and rules alone. Um, or he can be exiled and become a drunkard who turns up in the Hanged Man during Dragon Age 2. However, he will not appear in Inquisition if you do that. Um, if he becomes king, he can turn up in all three games. If you keep him as a Grey Warden, he can play quite a major role in Inquisition uh, because he turns up during the Adamant Quest. He's the Warden who you go into the Fade with, at which point you can either leave him behind in the Fade, which, you know, we presume he dies there, but I'm not convinced that whoever you leave behind in the Fade dies, but anyway. Um, or uh, you can sacrifice Hawk instead, at which point Alistair will head off to Weissabd Fortress to uh, try to report back. Uh, one final thing, he can also die by the end of Origins uh, in two ways. He can either be executed by Honora if Honora becomes queen. Although you have to, like, push her into it. She's not gonna, you know, like, it, it's it's definitely influenced by your choice. You kind of have to tell Honora to execute him if you want to do that. Or he can die slaying the Archdemon. Um, he's also one of three possible fathers to Kieran, Morrigan's son. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that if he fathers Kieran during Morrigan's ritual... That means that Kieran is heir to the Ferelden throne. It also means that Kieran has elf blood in him and mage blood in him. Although he would have mage blood from Morrigan anyway. But um, yeah, if Alistair is Kieran's father, it makes Kieran even more interesting, I think. And on that note, let's move on to Honora. I believe I can speak for myself. <gasps> Honora is the daughter of Loghain McTeer and the wife slash widow of King Caelan. Uh, her father was King Marek's best friend and she was betrothed to Prince Caelan, as he was then, when they were still children. Uh, they were reportedly really close friends. Uh, whether that really blossomed into true love or not is not really clear. It's sort of suggested that it might have done by certain people, maybe, and possible codex entries, possibly a little bit, but it's just kind of like, we don't really know whether it was like true love or whether they were just sort of besties who ended up having to marry each other and yeah the marriage never produced any children and uh the uh, <laughs> as always happens people sort of blamed the woman and sort of said oh it must be because she's barren it might have been him that was barren or maybe they just sort of you know weren't that into each other in that way and were sort of more kind of you know friends who happened to be married who knows I think it definitely comes across that Honora is very fond of Caelan. However, she also thinks he's a bit of an idiot. And it's <laughs> quite clear that she's considered to be like the power behind the throne. And she also seems to be more loved by the people than Caelan was. That's sort of hinted at in certain codex entries. Um, which might explain why she can be accepted as the ruling queen so easily after his death. Despite the fact she doesn't have a blood claim to the throne. Now, I don't really 100% know how... Um, succession laws work in Ferelden because it's a fictional place but if it was following like succession laws in the real world like that it's not a thing right the king doesn't die and his wife doesn't become like the ruler that doesn't happen like she's not even queen anymore once the king's dead 
Um, yeah, I mean, there have been instances where it's happened throughout history, but I shall not bore you with my history lessons for this particular video. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. But she's she's always described as, like, very politically savvy, like, quite cunning. Uh, quite good at getting what she wants, you know. She knows how to play political games and things like that. So, you know, I think, personally, I think she's a better choice than Alistair. That's really controversial, but I just, I just think she's a better choice than me. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but she's quite divisive among fans. A lot of people really don't seem to like her. I'm not really sure why. Um, she does conspire against you in the game if you try to make Alistair king. Because you get to a point where she asks for your support and you can either support her as queen or you can say, no, I support Alistair. And if you support Alistair, she will sort of start conspiring against you. Uh, but you can't really blame her. I mean, she's basically been ruling Ferelden herself for the past five years. You can understand why she doesn't really want to hand it all over to, you know, Alistair. <laughs> I mean, no offence, Alistair. I love you, lad, really, but come on. How eh? You don't exactly scream king material at first glance, do you, darling? <laughs> anyway, um, she is also very devoted to her father, who is, you know, the main villain of Origins, so that could be another reason why people don't like her. Although she is fully aware of his flaws. Um, and she knows that he's kind of lost the plot and gone a bit doolally, but she's still very devoted to him. Although willing to turn against him, if she absolutely has to. If you agree to make her queen, she will side against him with you at the land's beat. Uh, but she'll also plead for his life. She doesn't want him to die. Something that I find quite disturbing, actually, is uh, if Alistair is the one who duels Loghain, you can't spare Loghain's life because Alistair will just kill him. And I mean, he literally, like, beheads him in front of Nora. It's, it's... I don't know. It makes me see Alistair in a different light. It's a bit... Mm. Anyway. Uh, yes, anyway, should uh, Loghain be executed and Nora made queen, she'll build a statue to him like, in memory. But she places flowers on every year on the anniversary of his death, which is sort of, you know, I find that quite sad, personally. Um, anyway, yeah, I like her. I like Honora. She's ruthless, but she's, you know, she's clever. She's charming. I think she genuinely wants what's best for Ferelden, you know. Politically, she's very on top of everything. Empress Selene even seems to like her. Uh, there's a codex entry that says that uh, Empress Selene calls her a, uh, a solitary rose amongst brambles. <laughs> The brambles presumably being the rest of Ferelden, which isn't so cool, but still. Uh, one last note, it is worth noting that Honora cannot die in Origins. If Alistair is made king, she refuses to recognise him as king. And a lot of people push for her to be executed, but he refuses to execute her and instead uh, imprisons her. So yeah, good for you, Alistair. Not killing Honora. I, I can't find much evidence of what happens to her after that, though. She doesn't seem to be... If she's imprisoned in Origins, there doesn't seem to be much in the Codex about her come Inquisition, about, like, what actually happens to her. Like, is she still just in prison? Did she escape? Did she die? Like, what's going on? Um, so, I don't know. Somebody could probably write a fan fiction about it or something. Right, next. Anders. <laughs> No, do you know what? Fuck Anders. Antiva. That's a much happier subject, isn't it? That's a nicer one. That's a nice lighter topic. Right, okay, yes, Antiva. For this one, I went on a deep dive into the entire history of Antiva, and honestly, for a country that we haven't even visited yet in the games, there is a lot to talk about. In fact, I might genuinely have to start making lore videos. Um, I think I could do like a 10-part series just on Antivan lore alone. Um, <laughs> But unfortunately, for this video, because I don't want it to be too long, I'm going to have to like skip over most of it and just give you a few bullet points. But really, I would, I suddenly really want to start making lore videos. I always said that I would never make lore videos. I had no interest in making lore videos. And now suddenly I really want to make lore videos. But, you know, I'm fickle. You know this, this by now if you've been watching me for any length of time. So, Antiva is a country in the northeast of Thedas. It is exceptionally wealthy due to its aggressive trading methods with other countries. That's what the Codex said. I don't know what that means. I'm just copying what the, uh, what the Codex said. Shh, 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 it's fine. <laughs> uh, its main export is wine. From its many vineyards, it is quite a warm place. Uh, in the south of Ferelden, where we've been so far, it's quite cold. Uh, south of Thedas, even. Um, particularly in Ferelden. Although, Ole has deserts, which I don't quite understand. 
when you're frolicking around Olay in Inquisition, you can go from like snow peaked mountains to deserts. Like, mm, okay. So Antefa has a royal family. However, that royal family is not particularly powerful. Uh, it also has no standing army. So the country sort of prefers to remain as neutral as possible in all disputes. Um, yeah. And it, when I say it has no standing army, like, it's the royal family that has no standing army. The individual families that actually run the country have armies of their own and are often locked in vicious power struggles. But on, like, the big national political world stage, they try to kind of stay out of any drama because they don't really have the numbers to be, you know, getting into wars and whatnot. What they do have is the Antifan Crows, who are the uh, most famous guild of assassins in the world of Thedas. Very, very skilled, very, very threatening, very, very scary. They sort of seem to help to keep any potential enemies of Antiva at bay. But uh, as for like an actual army that they could raise and go to war, yeah, no, it's not a thing. So they sort of, you know, they're the Switzerland of Thedas. They like to stay very neutral, very diplomatic. So I've said that they have a royal family and then they have a bunch of other families that actually like run the country, right? This is because Antiva is a plutocracy, which means they are governed by a giant cartoon dog. No. <laughs> oh, think about it, it'll make sense. Look at me giggling at me old jokes. <laughs> it was the first thing I thought when I saw the word. I was like, plutocracy? What the hell has Pluto got to me? <laughs> and then, of course, I had to Google what plutocracy was, which led me into like a big deep dive onto real life plutocracies that have existed throughout history which led me to like down a complete rabbit hole of the um italian merchant city states which i'm assuming antiva is based on which led me into another rabbit hole of just like the entire history of the medici family <laughs> who were one of the very powerful families um yeah and and i i lost hours and then i remembered i was supposed to be researching antiva uh but you know what can I say? I'm a history nerd. So, yes, a plutocracy basically means that it's the merchants and the bank owners who run everything, like the, you know, the business people. It's sort of like if we got rid of all of our prime ministers and our presidents and we put, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in charge and Elon Musk and people like that, rich people, Alan Sugar, you know. I was going to say Donald Trump, but... Yeah, maybe we already live in a plutocracy. Anyway, yeah, so I mentioned the Medicis. This is from real life. So the Medici family were like, a, uh, they, they were a banking family and they ended up rising to power because this was during the time of the, uh, the Italian merchant city-states, which were plutocracies. So basically you had the money, you had the power, that's kind of it. So in the case of Antiva, while they have a royal family, they're really run by what they call the merchant princes, who are not literally princes, they don't have royal blood, but they're just really, really rich and powerful and they run everything. Most of them have their own armies. They kind of bicker and fight with each other. I don't know, it came across as almost quite tribal to me, but I don't know if that was that's how it's supposed to be. I don't know, I suppose we'll learn more about it when we play Veilguard, because we're probably going to go to Antiva. Yeah, so that's like a rough overview of Antiva. I mean, there is so much that I could go on a deep dive into. Like, it is a testament to how well fleshed out the world of Thedas is that, like, when you're researching countries in the game, you almost feel like you're researching a real-world history. It's it's that deep and diverse with all of these, like, little stories hidden in it and things like that. Like, I could talk for hours <laughs> about Antiva, but we don't have hours in this video. So, you know, maybe that'll be another video. But uh, that's the sort of general overview as far as I can tell. It's very... Their, their culture seems very Italian-inspired. They love food and wine and the arts. They're romantic and cultured and blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, that's a sort of general overview of Antiva. So, moving on, Andraste. Hundreds fell before her on bended knee. They loved her as did the maker. I loved her too. But what man? Andraste, bloody hell. <laughs> Not only are there a lot of A words, but they all seem to be like really huge topics as well. <laughs> Andraste is not a small topic in the world of Dragon Age. I blame the Dragon Age writers for uh, making their world too vast and expensive. Shame on you, Dragon Age writers. <laughs> Why did you do this to us? Uh, anyway, yes. So, <sighs> again, this is going to be a very brief overview because there is so 
much about this woman, a woman we have never even met, and I probably never will unless, like, they do a prequel series or she turns up in the Fade or something, I don't know. Um, yeah, Andraste is the prophet of the Maker, who led a rebellion against the Devinter Imperium and basically founded the Chantry. There is so much we could talk about with her. Her story is really long and complex, and like I said, it's like you're researching a real-world history when you're researching Dragon Age stuff. To the point where there's like, there's conflicting sources. So you never quite have like a full idea of what's going on because it's like, well, this person said this, but then this person said that. Just like you get in the real world. And you don't get that so much in fictional worlds because people sort of go, oh, continuity error. And it's like, eh, no. I mean, if you look at the real world, there's more continuity errors in the real world than there is in any fictional world, love. So, you know. Uh, but yes, it's one of the things that really impresses me about Dragon Age is just like, yeah, you, f you feel like you're actually researching history. It's, it's fascinating. Anyway, that's not what we're supposed to be talking about. So, Andraste was born in Ferelden, the daughter of an Alamari chieftain, which is what the Avar have now kind of... Well, the Alamari sort of became the Avar, so she was kind of like, you know... The Avar are, I believe, based on the Celts, I think. Um, she was later married to Mafarath, a different Alamari chieftain, Though she was initially thought not to be able to bear children, she did eventually give him two daughters. She also had granddaughters, but the records of what happened to them were destroyed. So there's no way of knowing if there are still um, any Andraste descendants walking around Thedas or not. Which sounds like a potential future storyline to me, but who knows. Anyway, to really over oversimplify things, Andraste was enslaved by the Tevinter Imperium, who she then... In ignited a rebellion against. She was then betrayed by her husband, Mafarath, and executed by Tevinter. We should probably mention the Maker thing too, that's kind of a pretty big part. So Andraste was plagued by visions of the Maker all of her life, and she came to believe that he was the one true god that created everything, and then turned away from his creations when they started worshipping the Tevinter old gods, which were basically dragons. Um, and that's kind of interesting, because like the Avar don't worship the Tevinter old gods as far as I'm aware nor do they worship the maker they worship like spirits and stuff so anyway uh yes yeah, so the maker was drawn to Andraste when he heard her singing and she eventually became his bride which I suppose technically makes her a bigamist which is an interesting take so yeah she's she's bride of the maker that is uh, who Andraste is so there is a popular fan theory that Andraste was actually a mage and this is also what the Tevinter Imperium believes they, they think that she's a mage, right? The rest of Theodas is like, no, she definitely wasn't a mage. Our, you know, prophet and saviour, not a mage, because we're kind of anti-magic, sort of. But whereas the Tevinter Imperium, who are very pro-magic, they're like, yeah, she wasn't a prophet. She was just a really powerful mage. Um, it would explain a lot if she was a mage. Like, she was meant to be a bit weird. <laughs> she had visions and fits and things like that. Very similar to Joan of Arc, actually, who was also supposed to have... Uh, so I'm always looking for real world history links. Um, yeah, she was also supposed to be plagued with like visions and things like that. Uh, and honestly, if she was a mage, it's entirely possible that the maker was just a demon who fed her a lot of nonsense in order to provoke a war against a vinter. Or a spirit. Or, I don't know, one of the elven gods. It could have been bloody Flemeth, for all we know. Whoever it was literally changed the course of history in Thedas. So there's some food for thought. There's a little thing to mull over. Like, who actually was whispering to Andraste? Was it the Maker? Was it just a demon? Was it Solus? Who knows? Who knows? And finally, right, there, like, there, there's so much, like, official canon that I could talk about, right? But I want to talk about something that I've never seen anybody talk about before. I mean, maybe people have talked about it before. I'm not very connected in the Dragon Age world, to be honest, because I'm quite antisocial. But, uh, yeah, I have no confirmation of this. I've never seen anybody talk about it, but it's a personal theory. I strongly suspect that Andraste is based on Boudicca, right? So Boudicca was a Celtic warrior queen who led a rebellion against the Roman Empire during one of their various occupations of Britain. We'll not get into it too much. Right, I have two reasons for thinking this. One, there is so many parallels between them. So many. Like, Boudicca, who was a real person, probably. Historians are like 95% certain that she was a real person. She was born into a Celtic tribe, right? And married a Celtic chieftain. Andraste was born into an Alamari tribe and married an, an Alamari chieftain. They were both religious leaders. 
They both had daughters. They both raised rebellions against imperial empires. They were both red-headed warriors. I could go on. There is more. Um, but yes, there's just so many parallels between them. Also, this is maybe the biggest point, Andraste was the name of the Celtic goddess that Boudicca's tribe supposedly worshipped. Now, the actual historical evidence for this is a bit sketchy. It's highly possible that there was never a Celtic goddess called Andraste and the whole thing has just been a misunderstanding from misinterpreting sources and whatnot. But again, that's not really important. The point is, in the legends, the legends of Boudicca, Andraste is the goddess that her tribe worships. And Andraste is like a demonic, warlike, trickster goddess to whom Boudicca sacrificed Roman women that she had sexually mutilated. <laughs> so yeah, interesting choice to name your righteous prophetess after, I always think. Like, it, I don't know, it always bothers me. I, I, I don't know whether I'm reading too much into it and they were just sort of like, oh, let's great create this wonderful prophet and we'll make her a bit based on Boudicca and a bit based on Joan of Arc and people like that and then... What should we name it? Oh, Andraste, because it's connected to the Boudicca legend. Like, that might have been it. That might have been it. But, I don't know. Like, if you Google Andraste, Celtic goddess, what you will get is, like, stuff about this demonic, dark, horrible, sort of, bloodthirsty goddess who just wants people to be sacrificed to her and... Even Boudicca herself is quite controversial. Like, she's not always, she doesn't always come across that great. So to, like, base your righteous prophetess on her is, I don't know, it always, it, I, it, mm, something bothers me. I'm like, are they trying to give us hints that maybe she's not as wonderful as we think she is? I don't know. But I mean, like, Andraste is actually still worshipped by some modern day pagans to this day, and even they call her a trickster. So, I don't know. It's just some. Food for thought. I don't know. Personal theories. Uh, this is turning into a history lesson. I knew it would. I can't I, I can't sit down to talk about anything without it turning into a history lesson. Jesus flipping Christ, woman. Anyway, shall we move on to the last bit before I fall down a complete rabbit hole of nonsense? Right, we are going to finish up with A&R. Weren't expecting that, were you? I did say... I was going to cover some of the little more obscure ones. There are much bigger topics that I could have covered beginning with A, but no, we're going with A&R. Because um, this video is long enough already. And A&R has always kind of fascinated me. So A&R is mentioned briefly in the Circle Mage Origin, in Dragon Age Origins, as the Mage Prison. Uh, a place where blood mages, particularly troublesome apostates, and even non-mages that have got sort of mixed up in blood magic and whatnot, are sent to. Uh, the Chantry sister, Lily, gets sent there after her fella, Jowen, is revealed to be a blood mage. And that's sort of the first time we hear about Aenor. It's like, you know, the mage prison and nobody wants to go there because it's awful and terrible. So, what little we know, Aenor was originally a Tevinta fortress where they conducted magical experiments. After Andraste was executed, the fortress was overrun by her enraged followers who killed the mages who were there while they were still in the Fade. So they were all asleep in the Fade, doing their magical experiments, doing whatever they were doing, I don't know, trying to get into the Golden City or whatever it is to Vinter Magisters do in their spare time. And their fortress was overrun by these followers of Andraste who just, like, killed them in their sleep. So it was, you know, apparently quite a silent and eerie sort of battle because they just killed them all while they were asleep and they were in the Fade. Um, and this left the Veil incredibly thin. Uh, so they thought the best thing to do was to lock up a load of blood mages there and I'm sure there's logic in there somewhere. Yeah, they were just like, yeah, the veil's really thin here and demons can come through at any minute. Let's put all the blood mages there. Wonderful. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> here's the thing that really gets me though, right? In Inquisition, you find a codex entry stating that after the Mage Templar war kicked off, the Seekers went to investigate Aenor to see what had happened there right, because nobody had had any word from them, and found it completely empty, completely deserted, with no signs of violence. And it's never explained what happened, or where everybody went. It's like Flanagan's Lighthouse, or the Marie Celeste. It's just like a total mystery that they've just dropped into the game, in a little codex entry that you might not even have ever read. Just this massive mystery, and I love a mystery. I love a mystery, but I hate a mystery, because I want to know what happened, man. Where did they go? What's going on? <laughs> what happened to them? 
And in fact, like, Aenor's like a double mystery because nobody even knows where it is, like, apart from uh, a few select Templars and Seekers. We know it's in the north of Ferelden because it was one of two fortresses where they were doing magical experiments in Ferelden, the Defenders, when they occupied Ferelden. Um, one was Ostagar, which is in the south, so that was one of the forts. And the other one was Aenor, which was somewhere in the north, but we don't know where it is in the north. Like, how is that even possible? How do you hide a friggin' fortress? Ferelden's not that big. You think somebody would stumble across it. But no, apparently not. It's just a mysterious fort that nobody knows where it is and everybody disappeared in it and the veil's thin and ooh. There's a fan fiction in there somewhere. I'll get on it. I'll add it to my ever-growing list of fan fictions. I'm probably not going to go around writing. Anyway, uh, yes, so that was the letter A. We, we left out some big ones, I'll be honest. So I'm going to give you some honourable mentions. Maybe I'll do a part two one day. Who knows? Honourable mentions, Aveline. Aveline, I'm sorry, darling. I love you. You're you're like my my favourite companion from... Okay, my second favourite companion from Dragon Age 2. Third favourite if Bethany's alive. I love you a lot, but I just couldn't find enough interesting stuff to say about you. I'm sorry. There's the architect. He's a pretty big one. But, you know, I had nicer topics to cover. Uh, there's Amaranthine the city uh, in the northwest of Ferelden that you uh, become the Arl of if you play Awakening, which is fascinating. There's the Anderfels, which is uh, another country in the northwest, but uh, not as interesting as Antiva, so I left it out. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the Anvil of the Void, another big one that we could have covered, but we didn't because you know what? We don't have enough time. I have already waited enough, so I shall see you tomorrow. We will cover. Wait for it. The letter B. I know. Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs>